back to the peer production track. So uh, first I want to say that this is not Sarah Tuketti. Not Sarah Tuketti. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> she fell ill and uh, could not come, unfortunately. But uh, so we rearranged a little bit in the schedule. Kevin Flanagan, who is now uh, uh, not here, I'm <laughs> uh, we we moved his presentation. So that's what you're going to hear. And I will say very few things. Um, but while you're reorganizing the electronics, I can. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so Kevin is going to give you the crash course to to the peer-to-peer. Uh, what and also a little bit of the landscape. What's what's uh, related? What's the kinship organizations? And uh, what's what's generally the idea of the whole thing? And uh, Kevin speaks from uh, a, a deep ex experience and involvement in the peer to peer foundation, including ten months in Ecuador and uh, yeah, well, I, and I was, project. That's not the topic, but uh, just for uh, saying something more. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. Sorry about this. Make sure my laptop doesn't turn off in the middle of this. Um, so, uh, hello. It's uh, very nice to be here. This is my first time at FS Cons. Can you please use the microphone properly? Oh, oh. Hi. Uh, it's very nice to be here. This is my first time at FS Cons. Um, and uh, actually, it's one of my first times presenting as. Uh, as part of the Peer to Peer Foundation. So I've, I've been working with the Peer to Peer Foundation by and large in a, in a voluntary capacity for a number, number of years. And it's only re recently, in the last two years, that I've gotten more, more involved. And I'm pretty much working full time with the foundation now. Um, so, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, cooper cooperation in the commons. Um, so, I, for the past, this year I spent four months in, in Ecuador uh, working on, um, as a volunteer with the Flock Society project. So the Flock Society project was um, it's Free Libra Open Knowledge Society project. And the idea was, it was a research project to uh, explore how you would make a transition to a commons-based society or a society where Social knowledge, the idea of social knowledge is, becomes the core around which society is organized. So this was a very ambitious project that uh, took place in Ecuador earlier this year. Um, George de Fermos, who will be speaking later, um, he was one of the uh, researchers on the project that I worked with. And uh, I was, uh, so this idea of cooperation in the commons um, for me, uh, this interest has grown out of this project, out of my work in Ecuador. Um, I worked quite closely with uh, another one of the re researchers, John Ostakis, and he's a sort of cooperatives expert. So his, his, uh, his, he comes from an experience of working with uh, the social and solidarity economy and the cooperative economy in uh, Quebec and Montreal in Canada. Um, so this kind of got me interested in thinking about the what what are co-ops what is uh, what are co-ops about i didn't i didn't this time last year i didn't really know a lot about uh, co-ops and I've, I've learned a bit i'm not i'm far far from an expert but uh what i'd like to share with you today is this um in my experience how there's a lot in common between the movements for um uh digital commons uh, knowledge commons and the co-op movement and so uh, to explore to make an argument for and explore the possibilities for uh, sort of a, a mutually supportive uh, alliance of these these uh, social movements um, okay so I'm a little bit nervous I have I'm not used to you know speaking like this so my, my presentation is text heavy it's basically for me to read <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make a start on it. Um, okay, so to give you a, a, an introduction to what, uh, what does the Peer to Peer Foundation do? Well, very simply, we promote, we research and promote, we research and promote peer to peer practices. So, when we may mean, what we mean by peer to peer practices, we don't just mean uh, peer to peer in the technical sense, which is, I think, is the most, uh, 
it's probably the more, you know, usually understood idea of what peer-to-peer -peer is. So people think BitTorrent or, or uh, Bitcoin, these are like peer-to-peer -peer sort of distributed technologies. They're peer-to-peer -peer in a technical sense. Uh, but when we talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, we mean it in a sort of a broader, a broader sense, like uh, as, a, as a dynamic, a, a dynamic of human relations. Um, so we look at uh, peer production, peer governance, and peer property. So uh, peer, peer, peer production sort of uh, takes in both of these. So when we talk about peer property, we're looking at different kinds of commons. Uh, we're talk, talking about uh, peer governance. How do people manage and uh, govern these uh, commons projects? So it could be a free software project. It could be Wikipedia. Um, lots of different projects. OK. Um, so. So today I'm talking about open cooperativism, opportunities for an open cooperativism, and a commons-based reciprocity license. Now to, uh, to talk about these I need to uh, sort of share with you a few basic ideas uh, behind peer production and the way, the way we're thinking about um, cooperativism, the commons, and uh, the different licenses that are, uh, the different commons licenses. Okay, so, so this is really a nice diagram. This is, very, this is a very useful diagram for thinking about peer production. Um, it's, we have basically four quadrants. And uh, from, from right to left, we have uh, from the capital, and on the left we have the commons. So the interests of capital, the interests of the commons and the commoners. Uh, from uh, top to bottom, we have cent centralized uh, infrastructures and centralized control and distributed infrastructures, distributed control. And this can also be looked at as, uh, in a sense, for four different tendencies um, moving forward into the, to the future um, where peer production becomes more and more a part of our lives. Um, so we have what we call neo-feudal. Uh, cognitive capitalist tendencies, and then we have what we call mature peer production, which is, we want to go that way, all right? We like, we want, we're all for the commons, we want to be over here with the mature peer production. So how, how are these four uh, broken up? Well, the, uh, the, the top left one, this is an attack of capitalism. Um, down here we have distributed capitalism, uh, the, sorry, the, the top left is global commons and uh, the lower left is resilient community so to give you an idea of where where different uh, projects you might be familiar with would sit in this uh, diagram and we can talk about them a little so uh, to start to start with uh, netarchical capitalism so uh, what do we mean by netarchy well it's a it's a combination of hierarchy and network, so the hierarchy of the network. Um, so we, here we have, we have Google and Facebook. So if we think about how value is created in peer producing communities. Um, so in the tactical capitalism, uh, so, well, co so cognitive capitalism in general is about control, the control of information goods, all right? So oftentimes it's the control of intellectual property. Um, whereas netarchical capitalism goes a little bit beyond that. It's about control of the platform. Okay, so the thing about netarchical capitalism is that uh, when the, the commoners, they, they enable peer production, okay? So we all access Facebook or, or Google. We're able to self-organize our work, work with communities, and uh, organize to produce things. But... Uh, but we don't, um, we, we only get access, we only get the use value, the utility value of these, of this, uh, these platforms. We don't get any of the exchange value. So all the exchange value, the, uh, the monetary value, um, is captured by Facebook and Google. So we're, um, it's, it's an exploitative model of peer production, you know. So, uh, you know, you might also say, there's another, there's another bunch of things here, like uh, 
uh, while, so basically the people are creating all the value. Facebook without the people has no value, you know? If uh, I actually left Facebook a few years ago and uh, the, the only way I could leave it was by destroying the value that it had for me. I had to unfriend every single friend that I had because they do this thing where they say, oh, come back. And you, you sign back in a month later and all your friends are there waiting for you. So I had to destroy the value that it had for me. Um, so, but without your networks, without you, you bringing your social relations and you creating the value, it has, it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't have any value without the, what the, the commoners and people bring to it. And it's the same for Google. Um, and, and what this, this allows, it's centralized. Because while the front enables peer production and uh, the front end, the back end, we don't control it. We don't have a say in how it's managed or designed or how they, or how they influence behaviors. So I don't know if you, you might have heard even recently, you know, of, of course, most, most recently, there's the surveillance issues, yeah? And uh, issues around privacy, which is huge. Uh, but also, so w but with both Google and Facebook, with the NSA, um, you know, harvesting users' data. But uh, also, Facebook were doing uh, psycho psychological testing on people. I don't know if you know this, but they were doing the psychological testing on people. So, the very subtle changes in what appears in people's timeline, how does that affect their mood, positively or negatively, things like this. So, this is like social engineering on a mass scale. Anyway, I, I, uh, I have a lot to cover in this presentation, so uh, we'll, move, we'll move on. Okay. Um, lower, the lower right here we have Bitcoin. Why is uh, Bitcoin under distributed capitalism? Isn't Bitcoin peer-to-peer? -peer? Well, yes it is. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer technology and it's, a, it's distributed. But it, uh, it's still, uh, it doesn't go far enough. It uh, reproduces the same um, sort of, uh, you know, aspects of capitalist accumulation. Um, you know, people are still inclined to, to hoard money, to speculate. It's the same behaviors that you find in the financial markets. So it's, in that sense, it's not different. Over, over here we have the Global Commons, Wikipedia, Linux, free software, and lower down we have resilient communities, uh, transition networks. Somewhere along the middle here, you would find fab labs, hacker spaces, uh, this kind of things. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. Okay, so part of the success of free software, I think I need to breathe, I feel like I'm racing here. <sighs> so part of the success of free software and free culture rests on its utility or its use value to capitalist production. Um, so uh, these are just a few little points to, to think about. Okay, so, uh, you know, IB, IBM is making a huge, uh, you know, use and profit out of out of free software and out of the contrib contributions of um, of uh, you know free free software developers and things like that. Uh, but they also support the livelihoods of a lot of free software developers. So there's like this, um, this sort of this sort of relationship. Um, peer production is hyper productive, and it is in this sense that it has the capacity to outcompete traditional IP-oriented models of capitalist production. So this is one of the appeals is of um, peer production to uh, private capitalist enterprise is, is that, um, for example, if I'm Microsoft, I have a budget of X to, to develop a, a feature, and I can only hire you know, five developers to work for the next three months on it, and that's I'm limited by that. But if these, if if uh, you know, on a comparable platform, Linux, a similar feature, the the source, the code is open. You might, you know, you have a, a an opportunity for a lot more contributions from the public and from um, from uh, peer producers and developers. Can I have a question? Yeah. But 
is that to be productive or isn't it, it to kind of to invent new technology that make you produce more you know, on a certain amount of time? That's for me that's being productive. Yeah, we, so for me it's more like you can hold a lot of free activities. So yeah. I'm just well, it's, a, it's, it's, a problem it's like a bit it. of both. It's like a bit of both. You okay, know, yeah. these are new. They're they're labor-saving technologies and okay. and this. But um, you know, it's it's also that you have you have all this voluntary participation. And sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have. A yeah. So no, it's, it's true. Sometimes this project. Unproductive. Yes. Yeah. That's true as well. Um, it it really depends on the level of interest in in the project. That's that's it. that's true as well. Um, so there is this uh, I don't know how would you say it? this. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm lost for the word now, but you know this relationship between uh, the development of free and open source software and um, you know capitalist enterprise, and that and that you know. When, when the capitalist enterprise is interested in the development of the software, well, well there's, going to be, there's going to be money there to help develop it as well. So they're contributing to the commons, and, in a sense. Um, but of course, it's on their terms. So, so this brings us to, today, the commons and the commoners are dependent on multinational corporations for their social reproduction. So this is, you know, you need, you need to put food on the table, where you, you like free software, or you, you know free free culture, um, but uh, you know nobody's interested in your project. But look, here here's uh, here's IBM or Google, and um, they have a particular particular line of development that you're able to contribute to. Um, so you you're, you depend on these large corporations. Um, so so the question is: Is autonomous social reproduction of the commons possible? Are we able to produce solely for the commons? and actually have livelihoods for ourselves so that we can work full time on the projects that we really want to work on rather than our, our being directed to you know, work on things that are sort of defined by the, the big uh, multinationals, that kind of thing. Okay, so... so mm. When we talk about yes. commons, do we talk about uh, profit or something like that? Hmm? The commons? Mm -hmm. Yes. Profit. Yes. How do you mean? Well, like in the sense of companies, you always give uh, example of these companies and so on. Yeah. The companies only work for profit, so they mm. they decide on making this product yes, because it will come up uh, two billion out of it. Yeah. And then this is the value of the product, and then two billion somehow, and then we'll put in five hundred thousand to make a product, and they will oh, get two billion. billion. No. This is the no. This is how they work, no? So, yeah. But you are always giving them as example with relation to commons. So is there profit involved? How much profit? They're well, making. There is this notion of profit. For in for the, the companies. In in the commons, in the in the idea of producing in this commons. Well, more, a lot of the time, the people who are producing for the commons, they have they have a choice. Um, you know, the, if the project project is open, you, the I, ideally. You have, you you know, you're able to contribute to it on a voluntary basis, but all that assumes that you're able to support your own livelihood in some other way. Um, so, you, you know, oftentimes people will work on a few different projects. Um, we put profit also in the sense of uh, you see this product, and then you see that uh, once you make this product in a in a peer to peer uh, fashion, the product will give uh, profit to the society, to the yeah, common uh -huh. society. So in this way, somehow. Because uh, when you are saying that uh, well, peer production is not uh, hyper productive, but well, it is. Uh, yeah, I'm saying it is hyper productive. So, yeah, so I would say it is hyper productive when you take it the same. So you take this product that Microsoft is interested in that will make two billion, mm -hmm. and you will you will see how Microsoft develops it, and the same product which will give the same profit mm -hmm. society wide so on, do it in a peer to peer. Uh, so this is what we're talking about. How do we capture the value yeah. for the companies? Yeah. So if uh, so, these companies, if they're they're making a, a profit, but like the Googles and the Facebooks, the value, the exchange, the monetary value is captured by the companies rather than necessarily uh, reinvested in the commons. 
So this is, this is a problem, and this is what I want to try and address with some of these uh, later on. But I have to move quickly through this. So, so, um, so practices of free and open sharing of knowledge are rapidly moving beyond the realm of code to design, education, science, culture, and politics. Um, you know, you, you can see, you know, in Sweden as well, you have the, you know, the Pyre Party and uh, similar parties in different countries. Um, we have open access in education. There's, a, there's so many different projects. It's really quite inspiring. Um, so to extend the practices of commoning and the values of commoners, those of reciprocity, uh, of openness and cooperation, um, how do we do this? Well, we must find some sort of so some sort of solidarity in social movements that share those values. And what I want to propose is that we look at uh, we look at today at the social economy, uh, the solidarity economy, and the cooperative movement. So, uh, people who are you know currently very engaged with discourse around commons, certainly people who are interested in peer-to-peer -peer open knowledge and digital commons. Also, we have the, in the environmental commons, people talk about, you know, natural resources. There's a, a strong discourse uh, influenced by the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who is not a Nobel Prize yes. winner. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, but where there's, where there's work to be done, I think, is it with the solidarity economy and the cooperative movement. So I keep going. So... So what is the social solidarity economy? This is a little crash course on it. Does anyone know about the social solidarity economy? Well, then this is the crash course, because I didn't know anything about it this time last year. So, um, so the solidarity economy meets human needs through economic activities like the production and exchange of goods and services that reinforce values of justice, ecological, sustain ecological sustainability, cooperation, and democracy. Um, so the social solidarity economy can refer to not just the cooperative movement, but also uh, fair trade. I don't know if you know this about fair trade, but it's uh, one of the founding principles of fair trade is that it supports small worker-owned um, cooperatives. So it's very connected with the co-op movement. Um, social finance, such as credit unions, not-for-profits. Not-for-profits aren't necessarily the same as a non-profit. So a lot of... we tend to get it confused. A non-profit might be dependent on government grants, this kind of thing. But a not-for-profit might be an enterprise where the profits are reinvested in the business or reinvested for social benefit. Um, so social centers, free software. Free software could also come under the sort of banner of the social solidarity economy. Um, one of the sort of uh, advocates of social solidarity economy has, you know, he's had discussions with Richard Stallman and this kind of thing. So, so to, to look back, I think it's interesting that we, we uh, you know, uh, Maxi Gass was talking about the Luddites, um, because the cooperative movement is quite, quite it, like it's, it's, uh, it's a long-running movement. And if we look at some of the core values of the cooperative, the seven cooperative principles are sort of the guiding uh, values of the cooperative movement. And uh, they're over 150 years old now at this stage. So, and, and you can see very quickly that there's a lot in common with uh, people who are working, the, the values people who are working for, you know, in the free and open source software movement and the, for the digital commons. So, number one, voluntary and open membership. This is a core um, feature of peer production, that people are able to, uh, you know, vo voluntary, voluntarily get involved in a project on their own terms. The membership is open. Um, Democratic member control, what does that mean? So, unlike in a, a, a conventional shareholder um, enterprise where you have one share, one vote. So if you have more money, you can own more shares, you own more influence in the enterprise. In a cooperative, you have one member, one vote. So even though, even though one member might own 10 or 20 shares because they want to support the co-op, they still only have one vote which means that uh, in terms of uh, income equality, you, have, uh, you might have you know, members that have less income or more, but everybody has the same say it's a, in, in uh, decision-making within the co-op. So that could be in multiple different ways. That could be in you know, electing the management, um, electing somebody to the board, 
of directors and uh, likewise. And likewise, you can recall them. There's a, a huge number of different models. Um, member economic participation. This is deciding on how the money is dealt with, what happens with the, the surplus when they make an income, and uh, these kinds of things. Autonomy and independence. Um, the, this is, the reason this is important is because if a co-op is working with the government, they need to ensure that they still retain their democratic member control, that these values are, these values are what's most important. You don't just give up your democratic say in uh, how the co-op and how the enterprise is managed just because you're working with the government and they favor a different model. Um, education, training and information, that's, uh, you know, these are, you know, training of staff, uh, uh, letting people, I, I think, uh, having people involved in learning about cooperative values and cooperative culture. Um, cooperation among cooperatives. Uh, concern for community. So this is, this is quite an important one that <coughs> we'll come back to later. So these are ideals. Um, they're over 150 years old. They emerged during the, during, um, during the Industrial Revolution. Um, and how different co-ops interpret this uh, can, can vary quite a lot. Um, another, another interesting thing that I've come across is, is that uh, there's such thing as, just to mention it quickly, I have it here, there's such thing as an asset block. So like, like a, in a free software, the license ensures that the, the, the code or the uh, creative works remains in the commons. Likewise, there are mechanisms, legal mechanisms for co-ops to create an asset block. So even if the members all decide that uh, you know, they, they don't want to work in a co-op anymore, the property that belongs to the co-op would have to be donated and returned to or passed on to another cooperative enterprise or another social benefit organization or a charity or something like that. So there's ways of keeping the property that belongs to the, the cooperative in the commons as such. So when people think about co-ops, they often think about agricultural co-ops. And this, is really, this really is the, the largest sector in, in the cooperative economy. But there are a lot of other examples and some very successful ones of uh, health and social care co-ops in Italy, Japan, uh, and Canada, Quebec, Montreal. Um, there's industrial cooperatives. There's Mondragon in the Basque Country. And they have a, a whole range of different things. They make, they make washing machines, they make bicycles, they make all kinds of things. Um, and some of you might have been aware of sort of occupied factories in Argentina, uh, where they were making sort of you know tiles and different things. Uh, finan financial cooperatives, credit unions, ins uh, insurance. Uh, Rabobank is one of the biggest uh, banks in the world. Um, it's it's actually has a cooperative background, um, <coughs> though how closely it is. Uh, you know, working with the cooperative principles is, is, uh, is debatable. Um, there's also smaller enterprises, cooperative shops, bars and breweries. So just, just uh, up until, I didn't, like, like I said last year, I didn't really know a lot about co-ops. And I would have thought they were a sort of insignificant part of the economy and that they didn't have a lot of influence. But a, a bit of research shows that actually it's, it's, it's quite significant. Um, so one in every six people. Uh, on, on average, in the world, is a member of a co-op. Uh, 2.6 million co-ops uh, in the world, excluding China. So China would have a lot of state co-ops. In a lot of countries, there's state-run co-ops, and that, that comes with its own problems as well. Uh, so there's 1 billion memberships. Now, 1 billion memberships isn't the same as 1 billion people involved. It's, you know, so you can have, for example, in France, you can have, uh, you know, the average, I think, is... 2.5 memberships per person, something like that. And it can vary from country to country. So, um, according to the International Labour Organization, there's 100 million jobs in, in the cooperative economy. That's 20% more than the multinational corporations. 23.5 uh, trillion gross annual income, <coughs> which is larger than the economy of France. It's on an annual uh, basis. Uh, fair trade is one example, which is 1.2 million workers. It's an annual turnover of 4.9 billion. 
So in terms of workers' democracy, control over, over their livelihoods, this is arguably one of the most successful social movements of all time. Like I said, it emerged during the Industrial Revolution, um, and it can be seen very much like, in a similar light to the Commons movement, uh, as, you know, that it originated uh, as a, a socially oriented response to the increasing influence of technology in shaping people's lives. So how do we, how do we you know, our lives are being dictated by, by the, the, emer the, the arrival of machinery and mechanization. So how do, we, uh, how do we adapt to that? How do we, how do we make that relevant to our lives, the way we want to live? Social values. Um, so can, can the commons and the cooperative movement come together? Um, why, why or why not for digital commons? Well, this, this clearly I've, I've shown that there's a lot of shared values. Um, cooperatives can be an alternative to the startup culture. So one of the, the big challenges for um, people working with, uh, in, the, in this, the world of software and in uh, open knowledge is where, where do you, how do you finance your, your, um, your, <coughs> your projects? <coughs> um, you know, we have, we have, uh, we all alt have alternatives like crowdfunding. Um, crowdfunding can be problematic as well. I don't know if any of you remember things, there's things like uh, Oculus Rift, do any of you know Oculus Rift? And so people do this, you know, everybody gets excited, oh, I love this product, and, and everyone pays in their money, and then a year later, or whatever, they, they sell the company to Facebook, and where where are the original investors left in that situation? Well, if you were to create a, a cooperative or find a mechanism for doing uh, crowdfunding for a co-op, you could keep the you could what you could do is you could create a, a membership mechanism so that when your when your funders they get a, a little code that says okay you're a me you're now a member so whatever we do in the future with this with this product we're gonna we're gonna consult you in how it develops and stuff like that. So they're, like, they're kind of like financial investors. Um, so you don't have to give up your IP. Another problem with these sort of angel investors is that they're like, okay, we'll give you loads of money, but we control your IP. And uh, that's a big no-no for people working in uh, free software. Um, so a few other kind of points. This is sort of in general, so it's not specific to uh, tech cooperatives as such, but in general co-ops have a, a lower failure rate than traditional companies and small businesses. This is, um, so after, ye after the first year, only 10% of co-ops fail as opposed to 60 to 80% of uh, private enterprise. After five years, 90% 90, 90 are still operational versus 3 to 5%. Um, this is from like the International Labour Organization, so, but um, I think it's an interesting statistic. I'd like to look into it a bit more, but, but uh, there, there are reasons for this. Most, mostly it's because the, the co-ops have a social orientation. Their, their, their support, both financially, comes from the workers that are involved, but also from the community that they're providing a, a service to. Yeah. And another question about what's the difference, do you think, between having a cooperative that maybe is co Crowdfunded, uh, if you compare it with a non-profit organization as Wikimedia Foundation, you can use that as well for yeah, peer production. Yeah, yeah, you can use a non-profit non organization as well for peer production. Is, of course. is there any advantages? Um, the yes. Well, to, you can you can participate in the market uh, as a cooperative in the same way that companies. So it has the same advantages as and disadvantages. You can say that uh, an NGO is, uh, has a certain business models available to them, and uh, others are only available to um, like proper market actors like uh, companies and cooperatives. Well, it, it depends. It depends on the, the legal domain. So it can differ. What, what a non-profit can do in Sweden, what a non-profit can do in, in Ireland might be very different. It depends on the interpretation of what a non-profit is in the law. And the same applies for co-ops. Co so, for example, there are legal, uh, you know, there are legal issues for co-ops in Ireland uh, where, which place limitations on what co-ops can do, raising finance, for example, which don't exist in the UK. 
Um, so it, it depends on the it, it depends on the legal domain, which which adds it does add a layer of sort of complexity, something to explore. Um, the, I mean the 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 advantage of co-ops is that is that the people who are it depends on the level of, of control, right? So that the people who are involved in the production of the let's let's say be uh, cultural good or or software have have a voting right. So the, I mean. So this, I, I'll, I'll move on to a few different things in a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you can see that the level of, of um, what do you say about, about uh, control is mm. better in the cooperatives than in the non-profit uh, foundation. You can, have, you can actually have a co-op that is non-profit. Uh, okay. And you can have a non-profit that's structured like uh, a private enterprise where they just have a board you know, maybe they're a voluntary board, but oh, yeah, yeah. they they employ people on a contract basis, and those people wouldn't have a say. Yeah. You know, so so you can. Yeah, there's a, there's there's a lot of options. Um. So, so can the commons and the cooperative movement uh, come together? This is sort of for for cooperators. Well. Well, um, the the big thing I I think for this sort of solidarity economy is that they. They would be empowered to leverage this sort of the the capacities of peer production to compete more effectively effectively against uh, capitalist enterprise. The the social and solidarity economy is is uh, is is great has a lot of shared shared values, but it's not at the sort of core of the sort of information driven society or the knowledge society in terms of the way that they operate, in terms of the way they do their business. So this is, this is uh, something that um, uh, people working in with, with uh, open knowledge and digital commerce can really bring to enrich the, the, way, that they do, the way that they do business. Um, so this in turn supports the further expansion of social solidarity economy, enhancing its capacity to provide secure, non-exploitative livelihoods for those involved. So the, the people involved there, you know, they have, they have a say in the business and, and, and likewise. The other thing is that cooperatives tend to be more, um, you know, environmentally responsive because they're based in their local community. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to be externalizing the waste into the local river because uh, their families are going to give out to them. And it's not like they're going to get fired by their boss because they actually can do something about it. They can have a say in it. So, um, all right. So, so some of the challenges for the cooperative economy. How am I doing on time? You have five more minutes. Oh, okay, I'll have to be fast. Right. Okay. <laughs> the challenges in the cooperative economy. Um, so, cooperatives don't necessarily equal social and solidarity economy. So, like I showed the principles earlier, the the interpretation of these principles varies on the, depending on the co-op. Um, so. Co-ops have a, a strong history in with regard to sort of leftist politics, and uh, in some countries there's a negative history of state co-optation. For example, the state comes along and says, "Well, we, we like the co-op idea, and we're going to create loads of co-ops. Everyone's going to work in co-ops, but they're not necessarily uh, the cooperative culture isn't coming from below. It's being it's top down and it's state controlled. Like for for example, in Greece or uh, or in Venezuela, where they, 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 the government created loads of co-ops, but they were a disaster because the cooperative culture wasn't there, you know, and also the government tried to keep control of everything. Um, so there's issues of scale. This happens with software projects as well. So how do you, how do you scale? Um, what happens when you scale? Do you change? How do you manage your projects? Um, <coughs> as they get bigger, uh, they tend to... Tend to uh, uh, behave more like uh, like multinationals, like uh, so uh, maybe you know instead of hiring from within the company um, with people who are you know understand the cooperative principles, they're hiring from the the business school where somebody is you know they're coming with with a very different attitude as to how you run a business. Then uh, you know they're not might not be so interested in hearing what the workers have to say and things like that. Um, so this is this challenges for maintaining the cooperative culture, particularly in, as they scale. Um, labor inequality. So some co-ops uh, <coughs> have been 
have been known to, so they, they'll, they'll have a big company, it's all going well for the members, they're able to expand, they're able to have their finance, and they expand to another, another country. Um, but instead of starting co-ops in the other country, they start a private enterprise, and then you have, um, uh, so where, where the profit is collected for, for the member workers in the, in the, in the, the, the first country, and then you have um, uh, this, you know, this uh, people going on strike and things like this. So that, that's that's not good. They should, you know, if the co-ops are going to start new co-ops, they should um, start new enterprise. They should start a new co-op. Um, so so protective IP-based business models. This is sort of uh, what you might expect from a lot of a lot of uh, sort of traditional businesses. Um, so they 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 would be. Um, Skeptical about, you know, oh, I don't know, you know, I don't know about working with free knowledge and things like that. How are we going to make money? Um, also, the influence of neoliberalism. Uh, this is, you know, issues of scale. Uh, you know, people coming in from business schools and and that kind of thing. Um, I keep going. No, we only have five minutes. So, <coughs> one of the big things that open co-ops would have would first and foremost need is to extend the seventh co-op principle, concern for the community to support the creation of knowledge commons. Um, so very quickly, there's uh, different kinds of commons. Uh, when we talk about uh, there's rival goods, which are scarce resources. Um, this would be like natural resources, air, water, uh, forestries, fish, this kind of thing. Um, and these are these are managed commons. So this is quite different how you approach. This is quite different to how you approach a knowledge commons, which is what we were used to working with in. in um, in the in the world of the digital commons, so these are non-rival goods. So I have a copy, you have a copy. The fact that I have a copy doesn't mean you don't have a copy. Uh, we can both. It's an abundant. It's an abundant resource, and and the typical mode of operation is open access. We can share with everyone. Everyone has access to it. Whereas with a managed commons, you can't just open it up to everybody, because it's limited. So you have to manage that access somehow. Cooperatives, in a way require a kind of hybrid management process. So we have a, you have a, you know, limited material resources, but you want to enable peer production, well, open co-ops, uh, you want to enable peer production, so how do you make sure that it's very, it's representative of both people who are volunteering or contributing in a, or want, or, and that they might want to get more involved, they might want, you know, get a paid job or whatever. Uh, how do you manage all these things? So there are things called multi-stakeholder co-ops which try to be representative of the different interests, not just the, the workers and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't have five minutes. <coughs> so, um, so, other possibilities. So, one of the things we're working on at the Peer Production, uh, Peer to Peer Foundation at the moment is, there, it's called the, the Commons Reciprocity License. And this, this originated from what's called the PPL, the Peer Production License, which was, uh, you know, an idea from Dimitri Kleiner, and this is a really interesting essay. It's it's a critique basically of of the GPL and free soft, uh, and Creative Commons licenses. Um, so the peer production license, the initial idea was that uh, the the main argument for this is to create capital for the commons. So we were talking earlier about the social reproduction of the commons. Well, how do we create an in income streams for the people who are contributing to the commons, right? Um, so the idea was, with the peer production licenses, that okay, we have uh, a license that, like the like the GPL or like the Creative Commons license, is it's an open commons for people who are you know uh, a, con contributing in, in a non-profit way, and uh, it's free and open in that sense, but uh, you know it's open access. But when it comes to private for-profit interests, it would be limited to the, the cooperative movement. In particular, the PPL was limited to worker cooperatives, which is very, which is which is really quite just a limited sector. Um, so whether this is appropriate for for software is is you know is very is is debatable. Whether it would have an appeal um, is a, is another question. So the, the commons based reciprocity license is what the peer-to-peer peer -peer foundation is working on at the moment. 
And the idea behind this is to expand the uh, time, is to expand on the original idea of the peer production license, but including uh, a broader appeal to the uh, the uh, okay, a broader appeal to um, like the social solidarity economy and these kind of things. Anyway, this is this is a kind of a controversial discussion about licenses, and maybe we can continue it on a one-to-one -one basis uh, after, afterwards. Um, is there anything else to say? Well, there's a few links there about open co-ops. Um, so examples of open co-ops, tools, Lumio is an excellent one. Uh, hybrid management models, different ways of managing your, your projects. So anyway, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to talking to you afterwards. Wait then. Okay, sorry. I give it a sec if you want to have a question. You're really out of. In the meantime. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 <laughs> We're anti-capitalists, why want capitalists to cut? Um, is, is, is to sustain ourselves within the cap capitalist system as it is. So, but we don't want to sustain ourselves in the capitalist system. We are anti-capitalists because we want to go beyond. Okay, yeah. I would argue that maybe we need capital to buy guns, for example. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Well, this is well. That that's a good idea. Maybe we can start an open, open cooperative that's got uh, these three D printed guns, and we can manufacture them. And uh, you know, <laughs> uh, open arms manufacturing. Yeah. Um, well, well, the the re the main thing for me would be that it's an expand. It's it's this this idea of trying to expand the the field of the commons, and um, and to build on those social relationships and those kind of values that are core to commoners, but also cooperators, um, as, you know, so, and that for me is something that is sort of very, it's, it's a tangible and real thing that we can do here, here and now. And, and you know, one of, one of the things about this is that it's, for me, the commons is, a, is about a process of decommodification. Uh, so we're, we're when, we, when we're, working with, with the commons, we're taking things, while they have a relationship with the market, they're not the same as a market good. You know, and, uh, and when people are contributing, they're not the same, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way of taking things out of, out of the market and de decommodifying them in a way. And, and uh, I don't know, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm losing track of my, 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 my thought. Uh, so it's for for you know working with the solidarity economy. This is this is um, it's the same kind of thing. It's uh, trying to base your livelihoods and your work not 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 so that you're dependent on on what the market says, but on the values of the people who are working. Yeah, I think the first uh, principle of this seven um, points of principles from Haiti. Volunteer yeah, volunteering and open membership. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that one is a, is, is a crucial one. How do you combine that with with, um, with a cooperative that exists in the market? Can you just kind of hello? This seems like, like a successful cooperative. Can I be a member of it? Yeah. 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 Um. Well. Well. Okay. No more than in a free software project. There, there, there are, you know, I can say, hey, you, you've got a free software project. Can I be a part of it? But I mightn't have the skills to be able to contribute. And it's the same with the co cooperative. So if uh, it, you know, it's it's voluntary and open membership, but generally, it's uh, it varies from co-op to co-op. But generally, it's going to be on the basis that uh, first of all, they have the capacity to to take you on. And uh, secondly, that you have you, you have skills to contribute, uh, and that you're able to be able to work work with your organisation. Uh, yeah. So, but it should be open, voluntary, and open. Yes. Yeah. 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 Y
I mean, the voluntary, you know, we can talk about voluntary as in voluntarism, you know, people volunteer and pay, I'm, I'm happy to help out. And, uh, but then there's also uh, paid employees, so how, how do, can volunteer become paid employees, this kind of thing as well. Yeah, how, how do you manage that? Yeah. Oh, actually, just a minute, because this guy down the back was asking. Yes, because it's related to this, so I think uh, point six there uh, solves your problem. So you can, with your skills, you can go into your cooperation, cooperative, which is not uh, successful, but you can cooperate with the successful one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, 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 your skills are fitted. So co-ops, um, one of the, part of this is that, well, why are you going to compete with other co-ops? You know, and, and this sort of makes sense if you're thinking about free software as well. Somebody's making the same project. Of course you can fork, you know, which is, which is always an option. If, if the project management isn't going the way you'd like to and you think there's a, a, an option for it. But the cooperation among cooperatives is, is to work together and uh, basically expand the sort of cooperative principles. Um, actually, sorry, this, I think this guy is... Yeah, it's just a comment to the, to the principle number one thing. I, I guess it's kind of like free speech. Everyone's, everyone has the right to speak as much as they want. No one has to listen to you. <laughs> so, and that's how free software also works. I mean, you're free, you're free to make all the changes you want, but no one has to use them or, nice. or merge them in. But should you so, be in a co cooperative and nobody cares about you? It's kind of strange. <laughs> yeah, but but, it's, uh, but but that's how you kind of leave out the things that you don't want in the cooperative for any reason. Well, one, one of the things, the like like I said, is that is that uh, you know these are sort of different different kinds of commons. And what, one of the appeals for a something like a commons reciprocity license is this idea. So 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 we, what we need for the commons reciprocity license, I think I'm I'm not totally sold on it myself. But I, I think it's an interesting project. But what we really need is use cases. Um, it might not be so appropriate or you know, useful in, in, the, in the field of free software, but, uh, but in terms of uh, cult cultural works, which aren't, um, they're a little bit, they're, it's a different kind of product. There's, you know, it, it, might work, it might be useful. Also, in, with things like open hardware, where the cost of production, you have, uh, are, are higher. You're not just paying for, for the sort of labor labor costs of the workers, but you're also paying for the infrastructure, for the for the building, for the machines, the materials, all this, this kind of thing. So we, we need to look at uh, the use cases for for these kinds of licenses. Um, but I don't know. I'm getting I'm getting distracted. We were talking about the voluntary and open membership. We, you know, the thing about uh, co-ops is there's this a new approach, which is a multi-stakeholder model approach. So you have you can have different classes of members. So you might have uh, volunteer members who just take part on you know one hour, or two hours a week in their own time. It's not uh, they don't have big responsibilities. Then you can have another class of members who are more active. Another class of members that might be you know part-time income or full-time, depending on their level of involvement. You know, so is to try and strike a balance between, um, and you know, if, if you were to do this with thinking about, uh, you know, uh, digital commons, you need to have a clear mechanism, I think, for, for people who want to, if, if you want to be a volunteer, you can be a volunteer, but that you can also, you know, get more involved, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to. How, this is why it's interesting to these models. Okay. Um, so the questions. Okay, you you. Yeah. You're um, next. <laughs> as I understand this, I mean, in the long term perspective, there's also kind of a historical perspective behind this of like what actually, how is social change uh, happening? And I know, I mean, from the peer peer to peer foundation. Uh, yeah. Uh, I know Michael Bowers have been comparing, for example, how. Capitalists emerge out of feudalism, not by creating something completely capitalist, but by sort of more and more taking over from feudalism because it was more productive or something. But it still used feudalism to in, in creating capitalism. So could yeah. you tell a bit about the, how this 
the, the Imperial Foundation perspective on this. Is well, this, goes, this goes back to Maxi Gas's point about, you know, yeah, well, yeah. do you want to work within, yeah. <coughs> we don't want to work within the capitalist system. And <coughs> so, so actually, uh, an, an interesting example is is um, the Cooperativa CIC, the Cooperativa uh, Integral de Catalan, uh, Maxi Gas, you're, you're, invo you're involved there with the California. Yeah, I work in one of their projects. And uh, they, they're, they're a kind of federated, uh, you could say like a federated open co-op. Co um, there's, you know, the, there's the, the, the main CIC co-op which enables uh, an ecosystem of, of different co cooperatives to sort of make it easy for people to self-organize and, and create, um, create businesses. And the, it's quite successful. Uh, I think they have 2,000 members now. Um, so in uh, three or four years? In four years. years. In three or four years. And, and one, of the, one of the main principles is actually to, to have this autonomy from the capitalist system, from, from the state, autonomy from the dependence on the state, and on the market, so that uh, so that the those people involved, the community, the community, um, the workers, are able to self-sustain themselves. So they, there's there's people who are doing, ha uh, you know, hardware, software. People who are doing producing cars. There's people who are producing food. There's people who are doing healthcare. And <coughs> once you bring all these different uh, goods and services together, uh, you're able to, you're able to cut out. I mean. You cut out the state with the CIC, and you have to find other mechanisms for exchange. Right. So between between each other, like this alternative currencies and things like that. Yeah. So. <coughs> so maybe it's kind of to have like, on the one hand, relations between cooperatives or similar, and one hand relations to like the market, like, reduce more and more the. the yeah. Level. Expand the field of the commons essentially. Yeah. yeah. So that you reduce the dependency on on market dynamics. For to sustain your livelihood. Yeah. Okay. There's there's one one more. Okay, one more because you, you, you had your hand up for a while. You see. Um. Now you had quite a few numbers, and I was just wondering where they come from. The the numbers there. Those numbers are uh, yeah. from yeah. these ones. Yeah, especially the the, the well, they're useful, uh, but. I know. Like, I don't know oh, statistics. I have to include some statistics. Anyway. Yeah. So this, these are from these are from uh, two sources. Now, uh, one is the uh, United Nations uh, Census on Global Census on Cooperative Economy, which has just come out. And <coughs> this other, this one. So most of these are from from that census, but this one is from the International Labour Organization's uh, report on the cooperative economy. Um, so this. There's a few different organizations who are doing research on the influence of cooperatives on a global scale. So I can give you, I can write that down for you if you want that. Okay, I think we have to finish up. Yeah, I want okay. to say two things. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.